This is a um, scene, very complicated. It contains a ball and some lights. You want to have some lights in your scene so you can actually see what the lighting does with your shader as you're building a shading network. So looking from the camera, this is what the ball looks like. Default Lambert shading. So we want to put something more interesting on there. The first thing, of course, you want to do is assign it a new shader. So it doesn't really matter which one I take now. Let's take a blin. Let's take a blin while I have the thing selected. And it starts rendering with highlights, because that's the main difference now between the blin and the Lambert. I want to put some texture on there. If I select my object, all the tabs appear. You can also right click on your object and go directly to material attributes. There's the blin. There's also the blin to SG, and that's a shader group. So we have our blin. So this is going to be the ball shader. And I'm going to assign it some texture by clicking on the little checkerboard there. I'm going to put a 3D texture on there because I don't want to deal with UVs. And put a letter texture on there. Uh, it came with a texture placement because I had that selected. And we can fit it around the bounding box so we have something that looks sort of okay-ish. With these you can step between your connections so I can step back to my leather. Let's see what it looks like now. And we get a leather texture on there. It's kind of dark, so I might want to change the colors of the leather texture a bit. Uh, change the cell size, because I think the cell size is a bit too small. Make it more spotty, uh, and maybe even more random. So I messed with the parameters. And I get something that looks kind of interesting. But it still looks kind of flat. So say I want to add a bump to this ball. So I go back to my ball, get to the shader, and I'm going to put a bump on there. Now I could just click on the checkerboard, select the leather again. So the leather, there's another leather now into my bump. But if I render that, you'll see that those two are totally not aligned. So basically what you want to do is use the same leather texture in this case to create the bump. So how do we get it in there? And that's where Hypershade comes in. So I'm just going to go back to where the bump has gone. And I think I'm there right now. So there's no bump. I got the color in there. So we're back to where it renders like this. If we go into Hypershade, there's several ways to get there. There is a preset that has Hypershade and the Node Editor in there, but it loads kind of slow because the Node Editor is kind of complicated. If we just go into the two window view with the outliner and perspective, we can choose to display the panel Hypershade in that side panel. And Normally it comes sort of up like this. Oh, let me close around a few for a second. And there's three areas to the hypershade. You've got the a list of all the materials or textures or utilities. The list of things. You've got your work area and you've got the create area where all the things you can use live. There's the ball shader right there that I created. And we want to look at what I actually what's actually in there. Of course, in Maya there's more than one way to see the network. I usually right click and do graph network. You can also hit one of these buttons where you can see the inputs, the in and outputs, or just the outputs. So graph network is what I usually do. And we see we have the, this is our network. I can choose to show and hide to different areas. So I'm just gonna show the work area and not the create area for a second. It's a very simple network. We got a texture placement that places the te this texture and the texture is piped into the collar. Now we want this same texture, we want to use it for the bump. And again, there's 10 ways of connecting things, but one of the easiest ways to make connections even in your Hypershade is using the attribute editor. And if I just middle mouse drag the leather, 
into the bump map, what happens? A new node gets created. So now the leather is not only piping into the out collar with this one, the alpha channel of the leather, which is for a, a procedural text, the alpha channel is a black and white version of the uh, pattern. The alpha channel gets piped into the bump value of this 3D bump node. And that creates a bump on the ball shader. If we now look at the way this renders, we now have a bump that's exactly aligned with the leather texture I put in there. But if I change the leather texture, or if I change the uh, 2D placement, if I said, and oh, no, the pattern should be a little bit bigger or smaller, so I'm going to change the uh, 3D texture placement, it will adjust both the color and the bump map. Using textures more than once is one of the powerful features of using Hypershade. We can make it even more interesting. Say we want the bumps to be specular and the in-between areas be kind of dull. That would be interesting because there would be like the bumps would be kind of wet sticking out. So we want to adjust the specular value of this. So we want to change the specular color or the eccentricity, we can also play with that one, or the roll of one of these with the same pattern. So say we want to change the, the specular color. Now we don't want the specular color to just be the color of the leather texture. We want the black and white version to adjust the specular color. And the black and white version of that is that alpha. So how do we do that? If we just throw the leather texture in there, that's not uh, what we want. We could do that, wink, but now it just the specular color is just the same as the pattern color, giving it this really dull kind of look. So that's not what we want. I could do Control Z, or I can say break connection on the specular color node. We want basically the alpha channel in there. Now this is another way to make connections. You can right click on this little arrow there and say what you want to put into something. So I want the out alpha to go into my, and now I'm just going to left mouse click and see where it should be connected to. So we want it in the specular collar, but as you see, I cannot put it directly in the specular collar because the specular collar is a collar with three channels. I can put it into uh, I can say I want it to put it into some other or into the default. If I do other, I get my connection editor. And the connection editor allows you to make any connection you want in Maya. So I'm going to take my out alpha and I'm going to find the input that's called the specular collar. Specular collar, there it is. If they're alphabetical. And I'm going to take this out alpha and put it in all three channels of my specular color. So basically using it as a black and white channel. So now it's extremely specular at the white areas, at the tops, and not specular at all in between. We have no control over how much specular we get on the bumps. Because there's no, like, with a, uh, if you put something into a bump map, you have a bump value slider. You don't have something like that with a specular color slider or something. So what we want to do is not just use the alpha, but use something that's driven by the alpha and, and be able to set the values, the minimum and the maximum value. And that's where these really handy utility nodes come in. And this is one that, that's going to be used a lot. You can use this one to have a black and white image drive basically any parameter. So if we go to remap value, the handy node, if you take that alpha channel and if you plop it into default, it doesn't know what the default is, so it will bring up the connection editor. 
So I have to put the out alpha into my input value because I want to modulate the level of the alpha channel. And this is basically a ramp. The input value of 0 has now an output value of 0, and the input value of 1 has an output value of 1, meaning it doesn't do anything. But if we give it a minimum value of like 0.3, then where it's black, the output value will be like what is now 0.26. And I don't want full white on the other side, so I'm going to bring this down a bit. And it's a linear ramp. I can also play with what kind of ramp I want in there. So what I'm basically doing is changing this 0 to 1 value from black and white to dark gray, light gray, 0.2 to 0.8. And I'm going to use that to then drive my specular color. So I'm going to take the output and put it into my specular color, which I can't do again because it's a color. So I have to do other, take the out value, and find my specular color again. There it is. <clears throat> it's in italics, meaning there already is a connection coming into it. And what you see if I start connecting it, the other connections get broken. So, wink, wink, wink. Now, the out value of the reverb value goes into my specular collar, and the out collar still goes into the collar. If I want to be neat about it, I call this remap specular leather or something. So we know which one is what. And now if I if I keep this one and I re-render it, you see I, still, I get some specularity back in between. It's not as extreme anymore, but I can use this to drive my specular. So if this were an image texture where it said this is clothing and this is skin, you can use the black and white image texture to drive how much specular you got, how much diffuse you got, all kinds of parameters. So basically, with using a lot of remap values, you can change the parameters of a single material to look different in different spots. And that's one of the great powers of the hypershade.